Can people take power and fight against uh, arms trade, drugs trade, and so on? And if so, can they, should they do it by violence? Well, you know, just, just forget about principle for a moment and just think about tactics. I mean, you want to pick tactics that are likely to achieve something. Otherwise, it's just posturing. Well, if you, if you, if you look for tactics that might achieve something, you don't uh, uh, accept the battleground uh, that your opponent prefers. Now, the state power prefers violence. They have a monopoly of violence. You know, no matter how much violence uh, protesters will use, they'll use more. Um, that's why, say, from the 1960s, when I was talking to students about uh, activism, I, I advised them not to wear helmets in demonstrations. I mean, yes, the police are violent, but if you wear a helmet, they'll just get more violent. And if you come along with, uh, you know, a rifle, they'll come along with a tank. If you come with a tank, they'll come with a B-52. You know, that's, it's not, a, it's a battle you're going to lose. Uh, and their, you know, their strength is violence. Uh, the, uh, the strength of the opposition is popular mobilization and nonviolence. Actually, that's what happened in Iraq. Strikingly in Iraq, of course, it's never discussed that way. Uh, you know, the governments and media and intellectuals don't want you to know about the power of, of, of about popular power and what can be achieved by nonviolence. But if you think about it in Iraq, that's pretty much what happened. Uh, there was violent resistance. The U.S. easily crushed it. You know, they can kill insurgents. They can level Fallujah. They can. Uh, you know, destroy towns and villages, no matter what it is, uh, they have much more violence at their command. What they could not do was deal with nonviolent demonstrations. Uh, when the Ayatollah Sistani called for people to come out in the streets and demand elections, which the U.S. was trying to prevent, they were all the way through, they wanted to prevent elections to impose their own clients and so on, they just couldn't respond. They couldn't do anything with hundreds of thousands of people in the streets. So they permitted elections. Then they tried to control and manipulate the elections. Well, they ran into the force of Iraqi nationalism. Finally, at the end, it's what I said, by January 2008, they were insisting, the U.S., that they have to have permanent military bases, permanent right to carry out military actions, and control Ira Iraq's oil resources. They had to back down in the face of mass popular nonviolent resistance. Well, those are the tools of, uh, of the weak, you know. It's what makes you strong. I think that boycott and, is a very good idea if it's properly targeted. So I think it makes good sense to boycott, say, American corporations or French corporations that are operating in the occupied territories. I mean, they're criminals and they should be blocked. But what about an academic boycott? You know? and personally, I've never been in favor of academic boycotts, even in South Africa. And in this case, either. Uh, let's put aside any question of principle and reduce it just to the question of tactics again. Uh, now you have to ask, whenever you make tactical decisions, you have to ask, who are you trying to help? Are you trying to help yourself? so that you'll feel good? Or are you trying to help the victims so that you'll do something for them? Now that leads to very different tactical choices, always. In this case, uh, suppose that the question is boycotting, say, Haifa University. That's a gift to the hardliners. Now they're gonna immediately say, and correctly, you're a total hypocrite. Why aren't you boycotting the Sorbonne, or Harvard, or Oxford? Uh, their countries are involved in much worse atrocities. So why bo uh, boycott Haifa University? So it's total hypocrisy. It's a gift to hardliners uh, who can undermine uh, the content of the, the goal, the theoretical goal of the boycott. It may make the people who are doing it feel good, but it's harming the Palestinians. Uh, that's pretty common. For example, in, during the Vietnam War, I was rather struck by the fact 
that the Vietnamese were strongly opposed to uh, uh, actions like, say, the weathermen. Young kids, nice kids, you know, I admired them, I under sympathized with them, but their way of uh, posing the war was to uh, go down the street and break store windows. Okay. The Vietnamese were strongly opposed to that because they want to survive. They don't care if American students feel good. And they understood correctly that marching down the street with you know, signs and breaking store windows just increases support for the war, which is exactly what it did. It's a tactic that, it's a feel-good tactic, like I'm doing something, but it's harmful to the victims. What the Vietnamese were impressed with and said so is, uh, you know, if there was a silent demonstration of women at a grave, let's say, that they thought was impressive and it's the kind of thing you should do. And it's true if you want, if your goal is to help the victims. And the same is true in this case. If you want to help the Palestinians, think about what the consequences of the tactics are. There's also questions of principle, but I've put that aside. What about the, the consequences? Okay, and it's not hard to figure out.